Our current series is taking us through the 23rd Psalm. So as we begin our lesson tonight, let's return to that beloved Psalm and let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, back in verse 1, we have spent a lot of time on this verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And the reason that we want to stay there and continually go back to this statement is because it is the foundation for everything else we discuss. Uh, just go through, I hope you have your Bibles open to Psalm 23, because I want us just to go through and be reminded of this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I like nothing. Okay, so what happens when the Lord is our shepherd? Well, He makes me lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside quiet waters, He restores my soul. There are times of peace, contentment, refreshing that come when the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord protects and He provides. But think of the spiritual refreshing that comes when the Lord is my shepherd. Let's keep going. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. When the Lord is our shepherd, He is leading us, and we will follow His path. Again, provision and protection. And now we've got direction. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. So even in those dark moments, I like the way the Apostle Paul put it, at times when he felt pressed hard from every side and, and pushed down. But we don't have to give up. We don't have to fear. Because the Lord is our shepherd. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. God is saying right in the middle of where your enemies are, there will be a table, and it will be a table where, where there will be this bounty because the shepherd provides. Again, what a beautiful promise. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, what is the point of all of that? The point of that is David is talking about what happens when we live this out. This is not just a psalm that we want to read at appropriate times in our life. It is a psalm of comfort and so much more. It is a psalm that is filled with promise. Church, that's good news. Here's my question. If the promise is that good, the Lord is my shepherd in all of these things that we talked about, if the promise is that good, then first, why do so many people lack fulfillment in life? The very things we talked about that are promised by God when He is our shepherd. Do you notice how many of those are missing in life? They're missing in the lives of non-Christians and Christians. Uh, people that ought to be living with the Lord as our shepherd, but we get so caught up in the, the, the race of the world and in the ways of the world that we lose sight that the Lord is our shepherd. Be reminded of that. Why are there so many people that are lacking that fulfillment in life? And then, our big question for tonight, if the Lord is our shepherd, man... Why is there so much evil? And why is evil, it seems like, it, it's not just in the world around us. I see evil in my life, in my family, in the church. 
Places where if, if we're following the shepherd, there's protection and provision. But what if we're not following the shepherd? Then we've got a problem, right? You see, th this evil is going to be there. The evil one, the devil, he has been attacking people since the Garden of Eden. And as he did that, he, Satan knows no end. He is relentless. He even went after the Lord. He tempted Jesus. So if he's going to tempt Jesus, you know that we are fair game. And so we want to look again at this psalm with this idea in mind that the Lord is my shepherd. He is the one protecting me and providing for me. And it's, that's what we want to keep, is the overwhelming idea as we go into our study tonight. Author Dallas Willard says, We live in a world under the care of a holy, good God with unlimited power who lacks nothing and intends only good for His creation. Why then is there so much evil? Great question. Author Louis Giglio uh, tells a story on himself. He was involved in, in a conflict and it involved uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. He knew, he felt very comfortable that he was right in what he was doing, but he had taken the decision to take that high road and, and, and to not say anything in public. He was going to let things just kind of roll and he just thought that it would work out and the truth would come out. And it did. And so while he had, had not said anything about it, he had a friend that he had confided in throughout this whole process that was praying for him. But when it came public of, of all of that came out and, and he felt like he had been, uh, he'd been cleared, that it was shown that he was right, and man, all of a sudden it just started bursting out of him and he just had so much he wanted to say. So he grabbed his phone and he started texting. He was texting his friend. Man, I finally, I finally, that everybody knows that I was in the right. Everybody knows that he was in the wrong and this and this and that and that and da 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 da. Boy, he gets this long text and then he hits send. And he waited. He waited for a response from his friend. He valued his friend's spiritual judgment, spiritual wisdom. And this was a time, though, that he had felt under attack spiritually, and now he had been from that. And how would he respond? And what, what would be an appropriate response for a Christian? And Louis was just ready to let the world know. And he waited. And so he even opened up his phone because he wanted to see if at least his friend was typing something. Maybe he had just missed the message, so he looked, and, and there's nothing there. So he closes it back out, and he waits, and then finally there's the ding. He's expecting this, by this point, he's expecting a lengthy response from his friend. He didn't get it. Instead, he only received a one-sentence response. It is a one-sentence response, though, that changed everything. Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. I think back in Psalm 23, remember, uh, where, where the Lord said as the shepherd that he will, he will provide this table for us in the presence of our enemies? You know, I feel like what has happened today, I feel like we have prepared a table with our enemies, or provided this table for our enemies, and we're there, and, and we have provided this environment, this place for the discussion and the division and the anger to just foster and to grow. But what Scripture tells us is that the table has been prepared in the midst of our enemies. And so I think this is great counsel, that in the midst of conflict, in the midst of when you're facing temptation in life, and I'm facing temptation, don't Give the enemy. Don't give Satan a seat at your table. He's not welcomed. Don't do that. So what is our problem? Uh, Dallas Willard goes, and he gives a couple of ideas. He says, you know, a, a lot of people think that the problem is just humanity. Man, the human race is just out of control right now. 
Society is out of control right now. Our culture is out of control right now. And there's a lot to be said for that. So I don't completely dismiss that idea. However, do not forget that our true enemy is very busy. Willard continues, says that Satan has humanity in his grasp through the ideas, beliefs, and bastions of wickedness he has developed throughout history, and he intends to keep them there. He has got his grip on society, and Satan's holding on tight. He doesn't want to let go. So tonight as we go through, I want us to be reminded, the Lord is our shepherd, but, but there is something, that it, the enemy that is going to attack us, we need to know something about our enemy. And so let's take a fresh look at that tonight. What do we know about Satan? What do we know about his power and his influence? And then we're going to close with a real practical section of what weapons does he have at his disposal? Not as many as we think. All right, so what do we know about Satan? Well, we know that he goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, he has been working with Eve and, and just, just a couple of statements. He is creating doubt, and then he's creating temptation, and he does that with just little statements like this. Uh, for God knows that when you eat and, and eat of that fruit, it, from it your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so what happened? Well, Eve listened. And, and through his words of deception, through his temptation, it just lured her further away from God. And, and toward that act of disobedience. That's Genesis chapter 3. By the time we get to chapter 6, a few generations later, we see the state of the world. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that He had made human beings on the earth, and His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So, for everything that God saw, it was like every inclination of every thought of man all the time was just evil. I, I think there's a point to be made there. That when Satan started, it, it was just with this idea of it's okay to have the fruit from that tree. Look what it grew into within just a, a matter of a few generations. Every inclination of every thought was evil all the time. What else do we know about Satan? Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, crystallite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and zasper. Uh, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. 
You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. All right, some powerful statements from Genesis, from Isaiah, and from Ezekiel. Putting them together, what what are some things that we know? Well, Satan's downfall was wickedness and violence. He, he sinned, that is an open, uh, open disobedience to God, leading to rebellion against God. His heart was filled with pride and he was corrupt. And so we think about all of those things that were said in those Old Testament passages. What else do we know about Satan? I'm going to take you through a quick journey in the New Testament. It, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says that Satan has been sinning since the beginning. John chapter 8, verse 44 says that lying is his native tongue. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says that Jesus came to destroy his power over death. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 make it clear that Satan is our enemy. When we look around, sometimes we get caught up in our, our disagreements and our conflict with one another. Re- remember, Satan is the real enemy here. Don't lose sight of that. Satan is our enemy. In fact, he is described in Scripture as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What weapons, what weapons does Satan have at his disposal? Not as many as we think. Want us to look in 1 John 2, 16. We're going to go back to Genesis 3, then make a final stop in Luke chapter 4. And we're going to see the same three weapons used in each story. 1 John chapter 2, we're going to back up to verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And so John names out those weapons that Satan has at disposal. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. His three primary weapons. We see this in Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back now and read those first six verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Remember the three primary weapons? It's good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasing to the eye, lust of the eye. Desirable for gaining wisdom, the pride of life. Even from the beginning in the garden, we see all the way through here to 1 John chapter 2, we see a continuum of those three primary weapons. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. When we go to Luke chapter 4, 
Now we're looking at Jesus. This is right after His baptism. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days He was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them He was hungry. Here's the thing that I find interesting between Matthew and Luke's account of this story is of exactly how the temptation played out. And I think Luke is really clear on his statement where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Because if we're not careful, we'll think that Jesus went into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and then uh, the devil had an appointment set up with him. And at that appointment, he said, by the way, I'm going to meet you on Thursday at 3 o'clock and there will be a season of temptation. Satan didn't work that way. So Satan came and, and, and he's tempted through this whole time. And there are three primary weapons that are used. The first one that he uses is he says, Man, you're hungry. And there are stones. You know you've got the ability. Man, do something to satisfy your flesh. Turn those stones to bread. And Jesus said, I'm not going to fall for the temptation of the lust of the flesh. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then, Satan takes Jesus and he says, Look, I, I, know, I know you want all of this. I know. And you can have it. All you have to do is bow down to me and you've got it all. Satisfy the pride of life. And Jesus said, No, I... I I won't do that because there's only one to be worshipped. And it's God. It's not you, Satan. It's God. God and God alone is to be worshipped. Then Satan takes him up to this tallest place and he says, Look, man, look at what you can, look at what you can show everybody. Throw yourself down from here because you've got the angels. They're going to come through and they're going to swipe you up. You're going to be fine. Just go ahead and jump and, 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 and let everybody see that. And Jesus said, no, no. Uh, no, don't, don't test. Don't test. Interesting. Then verse 13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him when? Until an opportune time. So Satan wasn't done. Satan would come back. And he would tempt Jesus again. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Here's just some big lessons I want to leave us as we close tonight. Uh, first of all, understand this. Satan is relentless. If you think that, that Satan's going to just leave you alone and let you go about your business, it, if Satan's leaving you alone, then you're probably in a bad place. He's probably already won. That's why he's not bothering you anymore. But man, if you're striving to live for God, Satan's going to attack us. We, we need to know that. Well, we need to be prepared for that. So Satan's going to be relentless. But understand this. Satan can't force us into sin. He can use desire. He can use deception. He can lie to us but he can't pull us and he can't push us there. That's something we have to decide for ourselves. So don't give in to that. We make the decision. Don't give in to the temptation. And also notice how Jesus defeated Satan. Jesus, the only one who never lost a battle to Satan. Jesus, the only one who never sinned. How did he do that? Well, he answered temptation with an it is written. All three times, it is written. He knew the word. He knew scripture. And he responded to Satan's temptation with truth. And we can do the same thing. So maybe one of the questions we have to ask is, is all right, so why? Because remember the big question is, the Lord is our shepherd. We want the Lord to be our shepherd. Then why are so many lives lacking? Why are so many lives that seem like unfulfilled? And why is there so much evil in the world? Well, 
I think we can start very practically with saying, how much time are we spending in God's Word? I think about us as a society, as a nation, and as a community. I think back even a generation ago of how much more time individuals as a whole spent reading their Bibles. Not today. We have got to lead a revival in that area. We, you know, we want to be a people of prayer. Remember, 1002 every day. We're praying for this harvest. But we've got to be a people too who are diving into God's Word because we need to know the truth. We need to be reminded of the truth. And when temptation comes, we're prepared to give an answer. And that answer is, it is written. So do we want to see a world where, where Satan is defeated? Do we want to see a world where the church is stronger? Do we want to see a world where people are brought to Christ who say no to Satan and say yes to the Lord? And I hope so. Then we have to start that way. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. It's not just a statement to say, it's a statement to be lived. And when we live that way, we are diving into the Word because we know that the Lord will protect and He will provide. But we want Him to lead us. We want Him to lead us on those paths of righteousness. Because it's then, it's, it's then when He is leading us that we are able to do our best work for His glory. And that's bringing other people to the truth where Satan stops winning so many lives, and we take some of those souls back, and we bring them to the church, we teach them the gospel, and we share the good news of Jesus with them. For some, it'll be the first time that they've heard it. For others, it'll be coming back to that place that they once called home. But let's do not give up. Let's do not give in. Satan is relentless, and you know what? When the Lord is our shepherd, we will be persistent. We will be relentless too. Don't give up, friends, and let's don't give in.